Hello everyone and welcome to module number 2, Sampling Plants, presented by Kusum. My name is Andrew and I will be your instructor for today. Now, before we get started, please remember that module number 2 is part of the Specialized Quality Engineer and Manufacturing Engineer course presented by Kusum. The following training module has been created in order to train people on how to use Minitab. It is intended to be used as a guide for the analysis of data and self-taught training. If you have any questions, feel free to reach us out at info at kusum.mx. So, today we're going to be talking about sampling plants. Sampling plants is a key concept in any quality engineer's arsenal and must also be understood by the manufacturing engineer so that he can better design his process. We'll be talking about the quality control's role, the key statistical concepts that we were talking from the previous mod model, which is standard deviation, process mean, and process specifications. We'll be looking at basic quality control concepts, for example, sampling, risk, and confidence. And we'll be understanding what is AQL, RQL, producer, and consumer risk. So it's mainly a collection of terminology which you need to be familiar with in order to succeed as a quality engineer and a manufacturing engineer. Before we start, we need to talk about what is the quality control's role. So quality control is responsible for assuring product quality. That's its main goal, okay? In order to do this, it routinely samples and inspects the manufacturing process and its support systems, be it environmental, maintenance, facilities, calibration, etc. It compares them to the specifications created by the process owner. Now, a very important distinction. Quality is not the process owner. Manufacturing is. In an ideal world, and most of the setups, the manufacturing process was created by a specialized manufacturing engineer who decided how many operators the process needs, who decided what fixtures, what machines, and what parameters it needs, and then created documentation that was passed over to the quality process, and quality's role is just to audit the process itself. Now, in later years, it came about that manufacturing took shortcuts during its, its creation of the process parameters, specification sheets, and quality control started gaining steam. So that's why most regulations require that quality release the product itself. But quality is just an auditor. Quality is not the process owner. So quality doesn't create the process. You need to understand that part. Quality doesn't create the process. It just audits it. Okay. Now, we're going to get into the key statistical concepts that we need to make sure you memorize and understand. The first one is standard deviation, which is a measure of our data's spread. It lets us know how our data works, so how spread out our data is. Is it concentrated on just one value, or does it tend to have multiple values? Now, our process mean is a measure of the average of our data. So if we grab all our data points, add them together, and then divide it by the number of data points that we have, that would be our process mean. Now, we're going to look at an example right now. Let's say that we have two tables. The first table is the employee weight of every employee that Kusum has. And the next is an employee weight table for United employees. So as you can see, we have the names of the employee right here on the left side, and we have their particular weights on the right. Same for the United employees. So we can capture this information into Minitab as follows. Okay, we're gonna be heading back, and we're gonna copy this information. We're gonna copy it into Minitab. Okay. So once we copy this information into Minitab, we can start to analyze it. We can click on Stat, Basic Statistics, and Display Descriptive Statistics. So we click on this, and then it will tell us what variables you want to analyze. So select both, click on Next, and then click on Statistics. Now, we care about our process mean, our standard deviation, the first quartal, median, and third quartal can be selected, minimum and maximum values, and how many data points we have in total. So we'll click on end total. We'll click on OK, and then click on OK. Now, observe what has happened. 
Minitab has displayed in our session window the results of our analysis. We can see the, our variable, Kusum weight, and we can see United weight. Now, if we look at the process, both processes seem to have the same mean at around 67 to 68 kilograms, okay? However, Kusum has a smaller standard deviation than United. United tends to have a deviation of 20.99 while Kusum only has a standard deviation of 14.04. What can we understand from these results? Well, we can understand that Kusum personnel tend to have a weight that is closer to 67.90, while United personnel tend to have people at both extremes. They have really heavy people and really skinny people. Okay? Now, we're going to be going back over to our PowerPoint presentation. Okay, so you can see the steps are right here. You can follow through as you like. Then we're going to be executing a box plot. So a box plot that we were talking about in previous sessions is just a simple graphical analysis that allows us to know how our data behaves. So click on graph, box plot, and then click on multiple Y's, simple, click on OK, and then add both variables so they'll be graphed. And click on OK. Now observe what has happened. Our data, the consume weight personnel, our data is less spread out than the united weight. So remember that each section of this box plot represents 25% of the data points. So for example, 25% of the data points of consume are located between 45 and around 58. And then from 58 over to around 69, we have the, f the next 25%. So that is the first 50% of the people. And then we have around from 70 to 80, we have another 25% of the personnel. Then from 80 to around 88, we have the last 25% of the personnel. On the other hand, United personnel, the box itself is a lot bigger on the second core title. So that means that Right here, from around 45 to 50, we have around 25% of the people. And then from 50 all the way to 70 is our second quartile. So as you can see, the data is a lot more spread out. While the box plots might look the same size, if you look at the distribution of in terms of percentages, you can see that there's a lot of people that are very skinny, and then there's a lot of people who are really heavy in the United. So that's why the standard deviation of United is a lot more spread out than the Kusum weight, okay? Where each percent tends to be the same size. Now, we're going to be going back over to our slides, okay? As you can see, the steps are right here. Now, what we're going to be doing is creating a different graph. This graph is called a histogram. So the histogram will allow us to quickly visualize how our data behaves from a normal distribution sense. We'll click on graph, histogram, then click on simple. We'll select both and then click on multiple graphs. Make sure the option of on separate graphs has been selected. Okay, This will make sure that you have each graph in its own section. Otherwise, if you select the first option where you click on overlay, then your graph will look something like this, which will be a lot harder to decipher. Okay? So as you can see, the colors are a little bit mixed up. You don't really know which is from this and which one is from this one. So we'll make sure to click on multiple graphs and on separate graphs. Okay? Now, going to have your graphs like this, and as you can see, the spread from the Kusum weight. Kusum weights tend to be a lot more consistent across the range. While on the other hand, United has a lot of skinny people and then not that many people in the middle and then a lot of people who are really heavy. So that is why we can see that we have around one population section here and then another piece of the population here. We don't have anyone in the middle. So we can immediately see that the united weight is not normal, while the Kusum weight most likely will be. However, we haven't done a normality test. Remember, 
need to execute a normality test. But just looking from this data right here, it looks more like a Weeble type of distribution than a normal type of distribution. Okay? Now, most manufacturing processes will have quality specifications that we must meet. Quality specifications are the minimum and maximum that our part can measure. For example, a part can measure between 2 inches and 2.5 inches long. And, on the other hand, a person must be at least 1.50 meters tall to ride a roller coaster. So most of the time, quality will have a quality specification or a process specification. The terminology will depend based on your manufacturing site, but they're pretty much the same, okay? So, we're going to be doing a simple exercise. We're going to be going back to our weight example, and we will assume that a healthy weight for an employee must be between 50 and 75 kilograms. We will use this information on our box plot to show how much of our data falls within this specification. So we're going to be going back to Minitab, okay? Then we're going to be going to our box plot that we created previously. And we're going to right click, click on add, and then reference lines. Type in 50 space 75, and then click on OK. Two lines will appear where we create our range. We can even double click on them and change it to custom, put a dash, put it on red, then we can say around size 4, and we can create this more visually interesting graph. We can do the same thing for the next line. We can make it red again. Then we can click on the size, okay? So this is how you can create a more visual presentation for your staff management meetings. But the point is the same. If you look at the consumed weight, consumed weight tends to be out of spec, but it's less spread out. While on the other hand, United is way spread out. Its data is on one side and on the other. So it's not within spec. Neither Kusum nor United personnel could be considered to be healthy since their weights are out of the range. Okay? But this is how you can add process specifications to a quick box plot chart. Now, as you can see the steps are right here. We'll be breezing over to them. And the next concept that we need to understand, other than process specifications, is quality control concepts. Now, please note, we are breezing through a few concepts because they're basic terminology, not really related to Minitab itself. So that's why we're trying to do simple, easy to and understand exercises. In later modules, we'll be using Minitab's capability indexes and cap capability analysis to execute CPK PPK studies. So we need to understand what a process specification is, and later on, we can start working around with it. Okay? Now, now that we understand what a process mean and standard deviation are, we can start to tackle additional concepts which are key for quality control. The next three main concepts are sampling, confidence, and risk. Sampling by itself is the act of grabbing samples from a production run. As you know, most of the time you can't sample everything because you will have destructive testing or it might be too costly. So you need to do a statistically valid analysis to determine how many samples you're going to take from your population and demonstrating that it is enough samples to prove that your product has quality in it. Okay? So let's say I create a manufacturing process with around 1 million parts and I only take one part. If that one part is okay and I say, okay, all my 1 million parts are perfect, is that really enough? On the other hand, if I'm unlucky and that one part that I get is actually a bad part, does that mean I need to scrap the whole 1 million parts? So this is why sampling is key and understanding what sampling means is even more important. A lot of time engineers make bad decisions by thinking the whole lot itself is scrap while in reality it is actually good. And just for some statistical anomaly, you got all bad parts. Okay? Now, the next concept that we need to understand is confidence. 
confidence is a measure of how confident we are that we are right. Sounds simple, right? <laughs> well, it's it's a very simple concept. It means I'm sure with 99, 95% or 99% confidence that my conclusion is correct. The reason we can't assure 100% certainty is that the sampling size would become too big and too costly for us. So, for example, if I want to be 100% confident that the lot of 100 samples that I manufactured is a good lot, then I would need to sample, well, 100% of the lot. If I sample the full lot with a high degree confidence test and everything passes, then I can be confident it's good. But if I can only sample 10 parts, well, I might not be 100% confident. I might be 90 percent confident or 85 percent confident that I'm right but I didn't sample everything that's why I can't assure 100 percent certainty okay and risk is the other part of confidence it is a measure of how likely we are to be wrong so for example if I say I'm 95 percent confident well how much is my risk well five percent your risk is the difference between 100% and your confidence. So if I'm 90% confident that I'm right, then my risk is 10%. If I'm 85% confident that I'm right, then my risk is 15%. Okay, so how many samples can we take from a population? This largely depends on co how confident we want to be in our result and how much risk we are willing to take that we are wrong. We would obviously prefer to be right 100% of the time, but this is just not cost effective. In order to be right 100% of the time, we would need to inspect every single piece, which on big lots is just not possible. So, what can we do? Well, if we can't assure that we are right 100% of the time, we use a term known as confidence. So. In the manufacturing industry, it is generally accepted to be right 95% of the time. So this becomes our confidence. Remember, this does not mean that we're making bad lots. It just means that 5% of the time, our lot might have more defects than we think it has. But it does not mean it's fully defective. Okay? So let's say our, our lot of 1 million parts has one bad part or two bad parts and we think it has none, well, that's what we mean when we say we might be 5% wrong. Okay, now, if we are right 95% of the time, this is our confidence, that means that we are wrong 5% of the time. This is known as the risk. The risk is usually called alpha in statistical books and is identified with the Greek letter alpha, which is this little fish-looking shape, okay? Now, we're not going to be going too into depth. Calling risk alpha is just going to confuse things, so we shall continue to call it risk, as in how much risk we are taking that we are wrong. Okay? But you might be wondering, so how many samples am I going to take, Andrew? Well, now that you understand what confidence is and what risk is, we can determine how many samples we want to take from our population. This can get very technical very fast. So we're just going to be using a simple question. How many samples for what? And what do you want the samples for? Okay, so most of the time in a quality manufacturing process, you want to take the samples to assure that your product meets specifications. This can be considered by attributes. So we can consider pass or fail. Let's say you execute an electrical test on your part. Well, your part can either pass or fail. Let's say you execute a visual test for contamination on your part. Well, your part can either pass or fail. Let's say you try and do an interaction test with your part for dimensional check with a go-no-go -go pin. Well, your part can once again pass or fail. So. We're going to be using one of the key concepts in the manufacturing world, which is called AQL, RQL, and detection. Note that this is not the only way to determine your sample size. Just that during the manufacturing process control, this is what you're most likely to run into. 
Now, AQL is a measure of how many defective parts must be in our population so that your sample of X size will accept it 95% of the time, risking rejecting it 5% of the time. I'll say that again. It is a measure of how many defective parts must be in our population so that your sample will accept it 95% of the time. So note, we're saying, I want to assure that it will accept this even if it has the defects on it 95% of the time, risking rejecting it only 5% of the time. So let's say I tell my my supplier, I will accept your iPhones in my factory floor, for example, as long as I find less than 10 defects. So as you can see, I'm allowing defects to pass. I'm allowing unsatisfied customers, but I'm assuring my supplier that I won't be stringent with him and tell him, oh, I got one bad part in a million, so I'm going to send the whole lot back. So our suppliers created AQL in order to guarantee that we would not over-reject our lots just because we found one or two bad parts. That is our AQL. So when our supplier says, I have a 1% AQL, it means that he's telling us my lot will most likely have 1% defects or less. Okay? And when we sample that lot, if we if our sampling finds 1% defects or less, we will accept it even if we found defects. So that's why most AQL sampling plans will say accept with two two defects and reject with three. So if we find two defects on a 500 or 1000 size lot, then we will pass it even if we found defects. Well, on the other hand, if we find three or more, we will reject it. So that is AQL. Now, RQL is a measure of how many defective parts must be in our population so that your sample of X parts will reject it 95% of the time, risking accepting it 5% of the time. So it, this is the inverse of AQL. AQL cares about protecting the supplier from over-rejection, while RQL cares about protecting the customer. So it will protect the customer by assuring that there will be no more defects than those marked in the RQL. Okay, so I know it can, it can get a little bit confusing. There, are, these are new concepts. Feel free to rewatch the video at any point. So now we're going to be looking at an example. According to our manufacturing process, our supplier is assuring us that he meets a 0.65% AQL. That means that he's assuring us that his lot will have 0.65% defects or less and he's giving us a 5% supplier risk. On the other hand, we as a manufacturer assure our client that our lot will have less than 2% effective parts, with a supplier risk of 10% on lot sizes of 600 parts. So all of these means that our supplier, who's providing us the raw materials, claims his lot will have 0.65% AQL. So as long as he has 0.65% defects or less, we will accept the lot. Now, we are telling our client that the lot will have 2% defective parts or less. So that means that with 95% of confidence, he will reject our lot if, he ha if it has 2% defective parts or more, while we will accept our manufacturer's lot if it has 0.65% defects or less. Okay, so let's look at mini tab so that we can better understand this concept. We're going to be going to Stat, Quality Tools, Acceptance Sampling by Attributes. Remember, attributes are go, no go, pass, fail. So they only have two states. Well, variables are continual and they can have ranges like numbers. So right now we're just talking about defects, and we're talking about pass-fail defects, so we're going to be using acceptance sampling by attributes. Click on that one, and then we're going to click on go-no-go no, go defective, 
percent defective and we're going to be talking about an AQL of 0.65%, an RQL of 2%, a producer's risk, which is the risk that his lot will have 0.65% defects or less, and we will still reject it because that's the risk he's taking, of 0.05%, and our risk of supplying our client with a lot with more than 2% defects and that he accepts it, of 0.10 which means 10 percent now we're going to be clicking on options make sure the use hypergeometric distribution for isolated lot is not selected click on ok and then click on ok now Tab has created a handy graph for us right now as you can see it says sample size 587 units acceptance number 7 so that means that if we take from our lot of 600 units, we will take 587 and we find 7 defects or less, we will accept the lot. Okay? And I'm going to be adding a reference line right here, just to clarify this point. Okay. Do you see how the lines intersect? with the blue line. This is the lot percent defective part of the graph. So for example, if our lot is 1% defective, we have this probability of accepting it. The blue line represents our probability of accepting this lot with this sample size and this acceptance number. So let's assume, for example, that our supplier's lot of 600 units is perfect. It has no defects whatsoever. So it has a 0% defect rate. That means that we will accept it 100% of the time because there are no defects. Okay, if the lot has no defects, why would I reject it? Now, as the lot starts getting worse and worse, the risk of rejecting it increases. Okay. So observe, this line right here represents 65% defects. If we have 65% defects, we will accept it 95% of the time. So our supplier is happy. I mean, he can give us a lot with up to 0.65% defects, and we will still accept it. Now, observe what happens. Once the supplier is no longer meeting 0.65% defects, and he actually goes to 1% effective, we're still at around a 78% acceptance rate. So a lot more than a coin toss, and even if the lot is 1% effective, we will still accept it. Now observe, if I go around 1.5, let's add a reference line at 1.5. Now, the risk of accepting the lot is still at around 30%, which is around 0.3, okay? So even if he has a lot with 1.5% effective, I will still accept it 30% of the time with this particular sampling plan. Now, let's go to the point that we were doing previously. I'm going to add another a few more reference lines. Okay, remember we are talking about that we were guaranteeing our client that if the lot was 2% effective, we will reject it 90% of the time with a risk of accepting it of 10%. So as you can see right here, our probability of accepting a 2% effective lot is around 10%. So we will reject it 90% of the time. Okay? But you might be wondering, hey, wait, my lot is 600 units. I'm taking around 587 for sampling. Isn't that a little bit expensive? And the answer is yes. Okay. So you're taking around 98% of your lot or 99% of your lot for sampling. That will be really costly. But the reason why your lot size, your sampling size is so big is that you're trying to assure your, client, your supplier that even if he has defects, you will accept it. Now, what would happen if we told our supplier, you know what, as soon as I find one defect, I'm rejecting this. 
I'm not going to allow you to have any defects. Well, in that case, you can decrease your sampling size. You no longer need to take so many samples to allow your client to have, your supplier to have a few defects. So let's look at how that works. If I change my AQL to be 0.01%, that means practically no defects allowed, and rerun this test, I can see a clear difference on my graph. Now I only need to take 114 samples, but observe what has happened with the protection that was guaranteeing my client. I'm still I'm still guaranteeing my client the same protection that I was doing previously. But the only change is that I'm no longer protecting my supplier. So if my supplier provides me with a lot that is around 0% effective, well, I will still accept it 100% of the time because it has no defects. But if my supplier sends me a lot with the same 0.65% defects, then I'm going to only accept it around 45% of the time. So I'm now protecting my manufacturing process. My client still has the same level of protection I was assuring him on the previous example, and I'm taking fewer parts. This is what's known as a zero defect based sampling plan, C equals zero. That's why you will find that most manufacturing sites are switching from the old AQL, which only protects the supplier, to the new and revised zero defect acceptance sampling plan. Zero defect sampling plans take their characteristic by the fact that they will never accept during their sampling size a defect. It works for marketing purposes. Well, you're assuring your, your client, I never accept a lot from my supplier if it has defects. And at the same time, you're guaranteeing the same level of protection using a smaller sampling size. Okay, So that's why you need to understand the difference between an AQL-based sampling plan and a C equals zero-based sampling plan. If you have any more questions, feel free to leave us a like or leave us a comment. And we'll be doing future videos on different topics, so let us know what else you would like to see. Thank you very much for your time. Please remember that this training module has been created for your purposes. It's part of the KUSUM Quality Assurance and Manufacturing Engineering Curriculum. If you have any more questions, feel free to leave us a comment or send us an email to info at kusum.mx. My name is Andrew. I've been your instructor, and it's been a pleasure. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.